briefly upon workers' comp. It's uh, not unimportant, but it pales in comparison in terms of what we did last year on UI. Um, can you, could, uh, uh, I guess it would be you, Commissioner. Um, can you tell us what we did last year and what, I know there wasn't a great deal of uptake, but where, what the status of some of those cases are. I know there were some teachers that did use the law um, and why we wouldn't want to continue a policy like that this year. Yeah, so I'm probably not um, the best person to speak to this, but just so- Among the, uh, among the three you are, right? <laughs> Uh, well, and, and just so folks on the committee know, uh, our longtime uh, workers' compensation director, Stephen Monahan, retired uh, this past year. Uh, and uh, Dirk Anderson, who was the department's general counsel, um, uh, decided to make a career change and moved into workers' compensation. He's now pulling double duty uh, while we look for a new general counsel. Um, and I'm sure we can we can schedule a time to have him come on and speak about the program. To what you're you are mentioning, Senator, and for for the others on the committee. So there was a presumption uh, that was passed, um, essentially saying that um, if an individual uh, came down with COVID um, and needed to leave work, there was a presumption, which meant the burden was on the employer to, um, to prove that the, in, the, the infection um, or contraction of the virus didn't occur at the workplace. That uh, presumption ended. And so it shifted the burden back to the employee, um, which is typical in most cases of workers' compensation where the burden then was on the employee to prove that um, them contracting the virus uh, happened in the workplace. Again, either by way of, um, you know, uh, someone not following safety protocol or needing to work uh, in a confined space with someone else who, you know, became um, COVID positive. Again, there's a variety of different reasons there. And I honestly, I couldn't tell you what um, off the top of my head, what um, the cases looked like uh, when we had the presumptions uh, in place, um, but they did expire, uh, I believe uh, sometime late summer. So um you know, we can certainly have Dirk and myself come back in and, and share more details on that. Front. When you do come, we'll, we'll do that probably. Uh, Scheduling is already getting hard, but um, when you do that, uh, could you also have uh, Dirk give us the reasons why for a small group of people, I think it is small, why we wouldn't uh, continue. What, what's different this time around from last year where we debated that policy and decided to give uh, the workers the benefit of the presumption. Uh, yeah, happy to. We'll, come, we'll come back with that one. Um, so we're getting back to- uh, Thanks. You, 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 <laughs> you're somewhat inadvertently making the case for paid leave, but I wanted to ask you um, uh, if you could come back maybe I don't know who the right person to ask is. I remember when we had um, uh, the debate about paid family leave, there was an issue about just how many people already had protection in the workforce for themselves through disability insurance and whether paid leave was duplicating that for the individual, not for their kid or their parent, but for the individual and whether that was uh, uh, even a, perhaps a stronger uh, benefit. Um, I, I am interested in um, not quite letting go of this if there is some way to provide some income protection here similar to, I mean, I, I certainly don't want to see opening the door to 90,000 people, but uh, it does seem fairly Analogous. I, 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 I accept a lot of the points you've made, but that doesn't mean within those points there aren't still some people who are falling through the cracks. And um, I'm wondering if we could define it. It may not be worth it administratively. It may not be worth it for the short term. But and I don't know whether there are other places for people to go. 
certainly people who are low income and in need, maybe they can go to general assistance or some other thing, but that's a, that's a terrible option, I think. Um, uh, so I don't know if uh, you want to respond, Commissioner, with more, given what Senator Clarkson has, been, has very articulately said uh, as to what the, you know, the similarities to last year are. Um, I don't. Um, I don't have anything more to add on the topic right now. I'm. I'm happy to further the conversation. We can try to find some additional information um, that may support the committee's uh, position. So happy to follow up. Do you know? Do do have you heard in your circles anywhere any other state looking at this, whether it be through UI or? I mean, some states have paid leave, so I think they probably that takes care of it, but. There's not that many states that have paid leave, you know, maybe 10 or 15. So I'm wondering if any other states are looking at reopening some of the opportunities under UI or other kinds of programs, because it, it does seem like people are having to stop work. Uh, I'm happy to, po I have not personally, I'm happy to pose the question to our, um, our national association, but I defer to Cameron uh, as the director to see whether he's aware of any. Uh, very quickly, I, I'm not aware of anything either, Commissioner. I would do the same. Just you know, maybe pose it to to the National Association and see if there are any other. Uh, I haven't heard anything from any counterparts in the region or anything like that, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll take the quick opportunity to um, correct what I said earlier. You you were correct. There is a. Uh, one to six week disqualification for individuals who do separate if they quit because of a medical disqualification. So once they clear the medical disqualification, they're able to go back to work. They would have to serve at least a one week uh, disqualification period. Um, you know, we haven't necessarily had a conversation internally about it. So I haven't had any cases come to my desk, but I imagine we would want to be very, um, you know, um, uh, empathetic in those situations, given the circumstance and, and impose a, a very minimal disqualification in that event. So just wanted to clarify that. Right. And I'll just ask the obvious question. Is there any reason why we couldn't at least eliminate that one week? Right. Uh, I, I would want to circle up with the commissioner and with Dirk and talk. I, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't be comfortable saying right now it's something we would be prohibited from doing. So definitely something uh, we would want to, to look at. Uh, I know the commissioner who's here nodding. You know, we would want to be very um, uh, if we had that ability, I imagine we would exercise it. Um, good. Uh, yeah. I, um, I wanted to ask a question. Um, um, let, let, let's, let's, we're definitely going to have you back and we're going to end today at 1115, uh, cause I want to have some committee time. So we don't have a lot of time. Um, tell us if there's things you want to tell us about what you've been up to and what your, uh, what you have on your agenda for this year of legislative asks. And then I want to go, I see if we can touch briefly on the UI task force and what your response to that report is. Uh, I've tried to give you in advance the list of issues that we would be talking about here. Yeah. So uh, thank you, uh, Senator. So when we look at our policy portfolio for this year, obviously most of you probably heard uh, the governor's remarks the other day, uh, big emphasis on workforce development, workforce expansion, but also um, uh, and uh, recognition that workforce um, and workforce um, uh, vitality is every everyone's responsibility across all of state government. Um, everything from um, you know community uh, health to um, you know thriving schools, safe neighborhoods, affordable affordability, and available housing. Um, so we, when we talk about our workforce initiatives, they're really geared towards training and development and moving people, um, individuals either out of um, who are at a transition point, maybe graduating from high school or graduating from college or looking to return to the state, um, helping to move them forward or moving people into different um, industry tracks uh, in terms of training opportunities. So uh, we have um, two proposals that are currently under development um, and 
well, I can't give all the details because they're still being reviewed um, at the governor's level. Um, one does focus on uh, workforce and work-based training and learning. So on-the-job training, internships, returnships, apprenticeships, um, and how to bolster those programs. Um, and then the other one uh, looks at um, helping uh, individuals to navigate through um, the workforce system. So again, collaboration between maybe local workforce um, committees or boards, um, educational institutions, um, training facilities, uh, and helping to um, help individuals navigate and, and build those pipelines um, in those key industries or sectors that we're all familiar with. So those are um, the two primary ones. I'm sure there'll be more um, under workforce. Uh, we also have uh, two modernization efforts. Well, three if you um, count uh, the Vermont Job Link program. So obviously unemployment insurance modernization, uh, which we're all familiar with. Um, we're also needing to uh, replace our ailing um, FARS system, which is our fiscal accounting system for um, uh, truing up between our federal programs and the state's uh, accounting system. Um, that's gone through some significant uh, failures and challenges over the past two years. Um, and we saw that again this year, which delays um, the entire um, state's closeout of quarters and um, fiscal years because our system, um, again, has challenges when it comes to um, finalizing year-end or quarter-end reports. Um, we've had a lot of downtime with that system that requires significant um, technology um, uh, professionals working on it for significant amounts of time. So we're looking to replace that. Um, the other one uh, is the Vermont um, Vermont job link and enhancements around that. So I think we're all, you may all be familiar and I'm happy to have uh, Sarah Buxton, our workforce development director come in um, with uh, job link. I will say I'm amazed by the transformation that job link has gone through um, since maybe 2017, 2018. There was a data breach uh, back then, if you all remember, but also it's a, it was a very clunky system. It was not user-friendly for job seekers. It was not user-friendly for employers. Um, they've now gone through a complete redo of job link, um, and that's through the American job uh, Job Center Alliance or AJLA. Uh, and so it, the look, the tone, the feel, the functionality is completely different. Um, we are going through an RFP process though to ensure um, competitive uh, bidding on whatever Vermont's future system will be. Um, but also uh, there are enhancements that can be made with the VJL system um, that helps it um, cross talk to other state systems. Um, that would be helpful, again, for the coordination of, of workforce development efforts. Um, I think one, one interesting point of note um, that I think you'll all be um, pleased to hear in terms of numbers, it's not a great number to have, but it does show um, the amazing work of our team in connecting with employers. Um, prior to the pandemic, uh, I would say there was, you know, maybe a couple thousand uh, open jobs posted in JobLink. I, I would um, fair to say that it's represented less than 25% of the jobs that were in the market at any given time. And that was just because it was so um, not user-friendly. Um, based on the amazing work of the workforce development team and our outreach to employers and their participation and willingness to participate, uh, Vermont Job Link has about 20,000 jobs in it right now. Uh, um, almost 14,000 of which are Vermont specific jobs. So we do pick up obviously some jobs from neighboring states. Um, but uh, 14,000 Vermont jobs are posted in JobLink, which means it, the, the supply is so great that the it is driving demand from job seekers to go there because they know they can find a majority of the jobs that are available. Again, not, not a good problem to have with so many available jobs, but I would say it probably represents anywhere from 60 to 75% of the available jobs in the market right now, which is um, a good thing. I see Michael, Senator Clark. Right uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm just curious, you, you, is, your, is your ailing 
your ailing computer system able to deal with all those upgrades on job link? Because I assume that's run through your 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 mainframe system. It's actually run through a third party vendor. So we are part of a consortium. So there are other ah, states. Okay. So it's a web based program. Um, and, now, and what are the other states you're you're part you're coordinating with? I'd have to. I'd have to pull the list. I think the the core system was developed uh, by Kansas, the state of Kansas. Um, so I'll have to pull the list of, I think there's probably six or seven other states. They were one of our partners. Were they not one of our partners originally on the mainframe uh, modernization? I would were defer they? to Cameron on that one. I'm not, I don't believe so. Oh, okay. Um, but that's exciting. So the the, I guess the question I have is, you, you said that before we only had about 20, we only, job link only represented about 25% of the available jobs. What does the 20,000 jobs that are posted on it now represent? How significant a growth of representing the jobs that are available does that, what's so the app? Yeah, app? it's some loose math um, only because, you know, what I, what I'm thinking in my head is um, from our LMI division, they can identify the number um of available jobs. Now, again, it's a, um, I, you know, it's not down to the science, but it's based on an aggregate. And um, so we we believe there's about 25,000 available jobs in Vermont. So if we have 14,000 posted on JobLink, um, you know, I would we're, we're roughly at about 60 to 70 percent. Right. And I, I hate to ask this question, but I'm going to because I have a modest self-interest in Indeed as our son works for Indeed. Um, how, how do you compete with Indeed as a go-to place for Vermont people wanting to be employed? How, do, how does JobLink and, and um, I guess I'd say, why is it necessary given all the job search engines we have uh, elsewhere? I, I hate to ask, but it's no, like a question one would That's ask. fine. So I'll, I'll speak from a very high level. Then we can have Sarah come in and correct anything I say. Um, you know, JobLink, uh, the state has used JobLink, I think, for the past 15 years plus. Um, and so, but again, through very different iterations. The, the unique thing about JobLink for us as a system is that it performs three distinct functions. So the first is the job board, right? So uh, employers post their jobs, job seekers can go on, submit resumes. Um, it also functions as our case management system. So all of our casework that we do with job seekers um, goes through Vermont JobLink. Um, and then finally, in the end, it also functions as our federal reporting and accounting system. And so um, we do use the system to derive reports for our quarterly um, federal requirements. So in the end, we may end up with um, a system or two systems, um, you know, depending on uh, what the RFP looks like and who the bidders are. Um, I, there was a point too, to your point that um, some of those, uh, and I, again, this is why I would need Sarah to um, provide some insight maybe at a later date is um, there was a point where we were also cross-matching or doing some level of um, scraping of, of jobs across Indeed or there was some integrated um, component with Indeed. Whether that still exists today, I don't know. Um, but again, to your point, if we're talking about ease of use for the job seeker or the employer to have to post your job on five different job boards or you know, submit your resume through five different job boards. But I think what we do know is that um, you know, there certainly is no wrong door. So certainly having more options available um, for a job seeker is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, Senator Rom Hinsdale. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Can I like to read from an email I received yesterday because I feel like this is what I'm hearing a lot, if it's okay. Sure. I have a parent child center in Milton that includes childcare for children ages zero to five. Each time a child develops the sniffles, we have to send them home to parents who cannot afford to take time off work, who then are struggling to find a place to get a PCR test and then have to wait sometimes as long as three days for it to come back negative so the child can return to our care. But if we don't do this, it's COVID, we risk infecting a whole classroom and needing to shut down for families who aren't sick because we have staff who are ill. This is causing parents to lose their jobs and then they cannot pay for childcare. So then they lose their spot because we can't hold it for them 
because our margins are razor thin. So then how will this parent get back into the workforce? And what is to become of the family in the meantime? The vaccines are powerful, but the state of emergency is not over for families with young children and the child care centers that try to stay open for them. Um, I can ask a question. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm looking for a response. I'm looking for a sense of how, how what percentage of the of, of people who are reaching out to you who are going into unemployment um, are facing this situation and how you're collaborating with other departments and agencies to deal with this holistic issue for families. It's not as easy as a, a job link or you know helping them with a form. This is what families are facing and it requires a holistic interagency approach. And I'm wondering what your part in that is. Sure. Uh, so, well, I, I don't want to I don't wanna say the issue doesn't exist, it obviously does. Um, if the question is what, what am I receiving or what is our unemployment insurance division uh, receiving, um, you know, just straight up, it's very minimal. So we are not seeing people who are losing their jobs uh, due to COVID, um, except for, uh, again, a very small percentage of the claims that are coming in uh, to our unemployment insurance uh, division. Personally- Is a place for them to report that without having to give that information, just offer up that information? You collect well, they would need to, they would need to apply. Uh, and as they're applying for unemployment, um, they would be indicating what their reason was for separation. Um, and then, uh, you know, we needed to adjudicate or do additional fact finding on the claim. Um, we could also ask clarifying questions at that point. Um, I'm also just, you know, when comparing to um, the pandemic of previous, so 2020 and 2021, where I was seeing a large number of, of emails and communications, either to me directly through the governor's office constituent management system, or from legislators directly, um, that that has dropped off considerably as well. So where I was seeing, seeing maybe dozens a day, um, I see maybe a, a couple uh, a week, um, and usually they're not COVID related. So um, what we and are you lumping childcare into COVID related in this instance? Is that a separate category? Well, I, again, I'm not seeing any that would be specific. Um, we know childcare is an issue. If the if the reason um, for not being able to go back to work is childcare related, I would have to ask Cameron that. But I'm not hearing from from what I'm receiving, that that is the reason for separations. Um, at this point, what I see predominantly is someone who's, um, you know, uh, challenged with how long the process is taking to um, process their claim. But I'm not hearing um, from, from that point whether or not there are, I, I'll use COVID loosely in that there are COVID or COVID um, derived issues causing people to, to need to file for unemployment. I don't think that answers your question about what are we doing or what, how are we helping these folks? I'm just answering the question about what we're hearing. And I'll let Cameron jump in as well from what he's hearing. So um, I think at, from a holistic approach, the governor and the governor's cabinet is keenly aware of everything from whether it's the child care shortage, the issue that um, individuals are having finding child care, which is also a very um, uh, predominant issue. So it's, it's not just, you know, did my child care facility close down due to COVID, but there were there were facilities or places that closed permanently due to COVID and making our childcare um, shortage even, even worse than it was before, um, or healthcare industry workers and the shortage there. Um, so I, we are very aware of that. I think that's where you'll see also a lot of um, the work that's been done to help shorten or address the extensive um, testing uh, that's going on and the regime that's going on, um, or also the quarantine and isolation period. That being said, the only, um, I shouldn't say the only way, the, the way we can help people the most is when they reach out to us um, because we don't necessarily have an indicator every time someone um, needs to uh, leave their work or work remotely to take care of their child who's out of school or out of childcare. Um, but we do have a number of opportunities available through our workforce development division to help those folks um, from a, you know, 
what we are finding is that employers are offering much more flexibility um, in terms of allowing people to work from home or telework on a short term basis. Um, but again, that doesn't include those individuals that are maybe paid by the hour um, that again, if they have to take a week off, um, then that is a week without work and a, a week without income. Um, but I think we're all familiar with the um, to, to Senator Sorokin's point, it's not the ideal circumstance, but there are um, many different resources out there for those folks. Um, from a workforce perspective, obviously there's less of a ability to help those folks because they're out of work for a reason. Um, but if that work is not available to them uh, when their, their child uh, recovers um, or when they find out that the, you know, a, a positive test really wasn't a positive test, um, and can go back to work. If they don't have work available to them, um, then we would step in and can provide direct support to them in, in finding other employment. I think what we do know is that the there are, based on our unemployment rate, there are roughly, you know, and the number of people collecting unemployment, we're at a, an all-time low for, for unemployment um, and our unemployment rate in Vermont and there are 25,000 available jobs. So there are um, way more jobs than there are uh, individuals who are unemployed across all sectors, all industries. Um, and even again, to the, to the point about um, minimum wage that I know was on the agenda as well, we're also finding way more opportunities for job seekers who may be working a minimum wage job and would like to um, increase their income. And there are now many more jobs that um, were minimum wage prior to the pandemic that are now paying far above uh, minimum wage. So again, I don't know if that answers your question. I'm, I'm happy to keep going, but. Well, but you know, that goes to my earlier point about income protection. I mean, this is why we need to look at these, you know, and I think Keisha's point is a good one week, coordinating all the resources in state government to protect people, to continue to protect people during this pandemic because uh, for, for reasons that they have nothing to do with, they are impacted by this, by COVID and, and, and their wages are impacted uh, and their work is maybe jeopardized or not, but their income is definitely jeopardized. If they're not working, they're not protected by paid family leave, they're not protected by lots of other things. So they're, so I think we really, that's the lens I think we really need to be looking at is, is, is how do we. Um... I, I would also say, I mean, I, it's, it's outside my wheelhouse, but um, when we look at the entire landscape of, of services available, I mean, we do provide as a state, um, you know, rental assistance and other housing assistance. We do provide um, food assistance. There is some other work assistance or um, I, I should say other ancillary costs relief um, for folks. So that way they aren't feeling like, you know, where we can provide relief loosens up maybe um, their, their income in other areas. Yeah, but as you know, the challenge is immediacy in yeah, terms of- right. uh, yep. Uh, yeah. Some of those take time. Yeah, I think the, the other piece too, though, I mean, if we're talking about timing as well, we all know unemployment is not uh, like you are unemployed one day and you receive your benefits the next day, right? So if we're talking about a short period of time of maybe five days or 10 days while someone isolates you know, gets a negative test and, and is able to go back to work, um, you know, they're likely to be back at work before they even receive their first benefit check, um, depending. So again, I, it, to your point, it doesn't speak to the need in the moment of saying, I'm now out of work for 10 days. Um, how am I going to pay my bills or, or put food on, on my, Psycho my family? Psychologically, the fact that they may be getting money a week later is going to be very helpful to them, even if yeah. they don't. Sure. Pay yeah, uh, let's uh, we're going to continue with this um, uh, in future hearings, but there's a couple of things I'd like to accomplish in the next uh, 25 minutes. Um, we did have a we did have a UI task force this summer and they made a couple of recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like Damien to briefly, like in 10 minutes or so, walk us through and have the commissioner or others respond to what was suggested in 
that report. I don't think there's anything really earth shattering in it, but, um, and I'm not sure where we have to take some action. I do have a, a bill coming in on UI where we can use as a, a vehicle for any ideas we want to add to it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that too. So uh, Damien, take it away. Great, thank you. Um, so the UI uh, study committee report uh, has been uh, sent to the committee already too. So for more detail, you can refer to that report. Uh, the, the UI study committee looked at a few different things. The first thing was uh, what's sort of the appropriate balance for the trust fund um, to maintain its solvency. Uh, the study committee found that the trust fund is generally healthy, um, but uh, because of their limitations, they were only had three meetings uh, and five very large topics to cover. Uh, they couldn't determine a specific goal balance for the trust fund. So their recommendation is really to use the sort of background research provided by the report, which looks at uh, how you determine sort of uh, target balance based on US DOL's re recommendations and how other states have approached this, uh, as well as our sort of historic experience uh, with the trust fund since we made the changes that we did after the 2008 recession, uh, and then use that in conjunction with the annual trust fund report that's going to be coming out soon, uh, and kind of make an assessment there as to how quickly we're recovering and how high our balance got before and then determine if changes need to be made. Um, with all of these things, I think just an underlying theme is that we are significantly limited in what we can accomplish now because of the mainframe system. Um, so there are certain levers that we can easily pull in the context of the mainframe and there are a number of levers that we might like to pull but which the mainframe can't accommodate. So some of this is, uh, and the report goes into this more, um, there, there are a number of sort of considerations that need to be taken into account, which it would just take too long to go over this morning. Um, the next thing the study committee looked at was the unemployment insurance benefits adequacy. Um, and as all of you are familiar with, we had the uh, determination by the US DOL that the $25 additional benefit that uh, this committee worked with the House to pass last biennium uh, was out of conformance with the federal requirements. Uh, so the committee uh, reviewed potential options for getting that money out to uh, claimants, including creating a separate funding stream, which is something that would be permissible. Um, and then also increasing the minimum or creating a minimum benefit or increasing the maximum benefit, both of which have potential complications with the mainframe system. Um, but it didn't come to a final recommendation on any of those, uh, but it did sort of provide the groundwork uh, that this committee could then take up in considering ways to move forward. Um, one thing that the committee did conclude is that the current formula doesn't provide adequate benefits to low income claimants. Um, however, the mainframe restricts us from uh, really addressing that issue at this time in a, a meaningful manner. Um, and so the, the main takeaway from this was that whenever the new system is finally implemented, it needs to be designed and, and put together in a way that will allow it to uh, implement changes to the benefits formula uh, to allow the benefits to be better targeted uh, and perhaps more flexible depending on, for example, the state of the economy, or perhaps we wanna create a progressive benefit. They, the study committee looked at a number of different options uh, and again, because of the limitations on the mainframe and time, it just didn't, it didn't settle on a specific recommendation, but recommended further work, particularly in the context of the replacement for the mainframe and, and designing that properly. The next two things the committee looked at were uh, the issue of disqualifications for uh, UI fraud and uh, the issue of 
uh, liability for overpayments of benefits. Uh, with both of these, the recommendation is to consider uh, the committee's work and potential options in concert with the auditor's report on UI fraud and collection of overpayments. Um, two th things we're, the committee we're, recommended. We're going to hear from those consultants next week. So just so the committee knows that. Yep. Two things the committee recommended uh, that the legislature uh do further work on are the possibility of limiting the period of disqualification um, uh, and or allowing for a waiver of a period of disqualification under certain circumstances. Um, it, the auditor's report has similar recommendations in it. Um, and of course, there, there are a number of administrative considerations that come along with this. Um, the other thing that the committee recommended was that the legislature consider allowing uh, individuals to petition for reconsideration within one year after the determination that fraud occurred. Um, and this was going towards the concern that some in individuals don't really understand what's happening at that point um, or may not be in a position to uh, file an appeal in a timely manner. And so this would give them an additional opportunity to say, hey, there was information here that uh, wasn't considered or something like that. Um, and the one-year timeline is consistent with the other reconsideration provisions that are currently in the UI law. Um, with the overpayment uh, issue, um, the committee recommended in this case that the legislature enact legislation that allows the commissioner to waive liability for overpayments when a claimant is without fault and when requiring repayment would be contrary to equity and good conscience. Um, so those are two separate um, things that the committee looked at. The first is the without fault piece and the second is the um, when it would be contrary to equity and good conscience. Uh, there was some question as to whether it should be um, either or, or both combined together. Um, but the, in the general conclusion from the committee was that, uh, that we do input a waiver for those purposes and then that the specifics can get worked out in the legislation. Uh, and this would be consistent with uh, what other states have done, although the standards vary a bit from state to state. The federal standard is that they have to be both without fault and in addition requiring repayment uh, would be contrary to equity and good conscience. Um, but that's the requirement for federal benefits. So we could potentially do something slightly different for state benefits, but we'd have to do it with the knowledge that if there's a federal uh, overpayment, um, they'd be subject to a different standard. So um, the, the possibility there is to align with the federal standard and have one standard or possibly to have a slightly different state standard. The, the next subject the, and the final subject that was in the committee's charge uh, is the issue of uh, reimbursable nonprofit employers. Uh, again, the committee did not have a specific recommendation. Um, again, because of time constraints, the committee wasn't able to get sufficient testimony. Um, so the committee's recommendation is that the General Assembly needs to develop a better understanding of why nonprofits elect to become reimbursable employers in the first place, and then whether they actually understand the potential risks that come with that, because it's, uh, when you're a reimbursable employer, you're not paying regular taxes. Um, so you lose that sort of short-term recurring cost. But when you have a bill come due for unemployment benefits, it can often be a, a very significant amount, particularly if you have more than one layoff in a period. And that can be crippling for a small nonprofit with a tight budget. Um, some nonprofits, uh, there was some discussion about various approaches, but the, the committee didn't really have time to get a really good sense of what the approaches are and how many nonprofits that elect this actually understand um, the potential risks. The other thing the 
committee recommended is that the General Assembly should examine requiring a bond uh, for nonprofits that elect uh, reimbursable in status. Some states do this, and it essentially ensures that if they've run out of funding and they're laying people off for that reason, there's money sitting there that can pay the UI benefits and reimburse the trust fund for those benefits. Um, and a number of states uh, require that for reimbursable employers. Um, and then the final piece from the committee was that the committee agreed that all employers should be covered by the UI law. Um, and whereas Vermont currently exempts uh, nonprofit employers with fewer than four employees. Um, however, uh, uh, the committee also agreed that the General Assembly needs to develop a better understanding of what the potential impacts would be on those small nonprofits if we required coverage. Um, and uh, so recommended more testimony on that. And also one of the things the committee struggled with was the, the lack of information we have about how many small nonprofits there are, uh, how many employees are within that group. And it recommended that the General Assembly work with the department, uh, ADS and the Secretary of State to explore options for just developing better data tools so that we actually have a better understanding when we're crafting policy of who would be affected Affected and how many people would be affected by any policy that we adopt. The final thing that the committee recommended was that the General Assembly should generally uh, advocate for a, a new UI computer system uh, in which every variable can be adjusted easily without the risk of crippling the whole program um, through a catastrophic systems crash. Um, and also a system that allows us to easily implement both short and long-term changes to meet the varying needs of the state. So for example, with the pandemic, we've experienced a number of short-term changes that we either needed to implement or would have liked to implement, whether that's in response to a federal requirement uh, or the needs of Vermont, uh, Vermont employees or employers. Um, and then we've also encountered, you know, the needs of our state uh, here in 2022 are very different uh, than they were in 1983 and 1986 when the, the current tax structure and benefit structure was, was first put into the system. Um, and, you know, of course, we're all very familiar with the issues with having a 50, 40 to 50 year old program here. Uh, where the people who actually programmed it uh, are, you know, all no longer with state government. Um, and there's no documentation of the changes they made back in the 1980s that could guide a, a current programmer in trying to figure out how to make changes uh, to those changes within the system. So um, the, that was sort of a general theme with the study committee overall is just that as we modernize, we have to do it with an eye I to being flexible in the future um, so that the, the department and the legislature can work together to implement uh, changes and adjust to the varying needs. Did I leave anything out, Mr. Chair? No, that's great. Thank you, Damien. Uh, that's, okay. that's good. Um, so we have about 12 minutes before we're going to break. Uh, Commissioner, do you want to respond to anything that Damien said or that's in the report at this point and, and at this just, point i oh go ahead no i just like to tag on we all want an update on the mainframe and arpa money because we've all heard there you're getting a lot of money to fix you know to replace the mainframe so where are you <laughs> uh so on the report i think having it just have been posted this week i think we'd like an opportunity to go through it um, and I'm looking at Cameron, he can't tell I'm looking at him, but um, if he uh, has anything he'd like to add, but I'm assuming, you know, we'd like to go through the report and then come back with some, some well thought out remarks. You know, I, uh, having been on the committee and the task force, um, I don't really, my assessment is there's not anything really earth shattering there. I would appreciate like within a 
a week's time if you can just get us a, a memo on it as opposed to because we may not get back together for a while so if you can while it's fresh if you can just comment yep on the report that would be yeah great. happy to do that um do you want me to just uh speak to senator clark and comment or question sure, sure. Um, it, with regards to modernization, so um, there are, we received in the last appropriation, uh, three and a half million for phase one. Um, we're going through the RFP process right now. Um, that being said, uh, there's an additional request for, um, for money uh, coming in uh, our upcoming, whether it ends up being um, you know, BAA two or um, the budget uh, request. I'll leave that to the to the agency of administration. Um, but uh, there will be additional uh, requests for funding um, to support the rest of the modernization. I think what we're trying to make sure we do right now is we want to keep the train moving, but we also don't want phase one to be out of step with phase two. Right, so we want to make sure whatever we do in phase one is complementary um, to the other phases uh, when when we have funding assigned for those. So uh, we are going through the RFP process. Um, we've we've met with I don't even know uh, how many different vendors um, over the past year and a half to see demos of different systems. Um, it, there's a there's a part of me that says you want the right system at the same time uh, when you're looking at these systems um, that are you know uh, current you know everything and anything looks better than what you have right now um, you know so uh, but we've got some really talented subject matter experts and and technologists that are um, involved in that process so I'm I'm very confident in terms of our ability to to move this forward but um, you'll see uh, requests coming. In the and, what, and can you just give us a notion if everything went according to Hoyle, if everything went as smoothly as you'd like, and we identified all the money, what is the time frame? Yeah, uh, so so to your point, I, there are a couple of factors. If if everything it, before the pandemic, the average time frame I would say was roughly three years, two to two to four. So three was in the middle um, after the pandemic, and the fact that everybody is looking to modernize their systems. Um, it's probably more like four or five years. Um, I think for us, phase, we'll do it in phases. So it won't be a all, you know, um, an all done in five years. We'll do phase one and we'll probably add some functionality to phase one if we can. And we know we have funding uh, set aside for other phases. So I could see it being incremental. Um, so I think for us, you know, phase one is like the user interface. What do, what is the user experience? Um, and then there'll be some back end components to that, but that's still probably 12 to 18 months by the time it's fully developed and tested and, and then deployed. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask a, a question here that you might expect. I mean, could you incorporate into phase one, uh, some benefit changes if we alerted you in advance to do that, or is that technologically impossible? I would I would probably defer to to ADS, but um, really, for instance, the way it's been designed, phase one is just the claimant portal and the employer portal with some functionality about um, managing some adjudications work um, and some appeals work. So what you're really talking about is the core system. So I don't know whether that would be a not till the end or somewhere along the way, but it, it would not be part of phase one. Okay, so I just, I'll probably ask that question again during the session. So if you can talk to ADS and get back to us on that. Uh, yep. I mentioned that I'm putting in a bill and it's sort of consistent to what the department's concerns were around the $25. It just says we should do that $25 when the computer can handle it and maybe try and find some other funding source in the interim. Um, I know you're opposed to that, but you know, that's that bill is coming. It may be introduced today. So um, uh, one, one thing before, I let you go. Uh, Senator Brock, you had a question, right? I'm sorry. I no uh, more? Part, of, part of my question has already been answered uh, relative to the timetable. I know that earlier in the summer, the Joint IT Oversight Committee reviewed, uh, as the legislation required, 
uh, your proposal to go forward and we did approve the initial piece. And so I, I do piggyback on the question that Senator Clarkson raised as far as the timetable of getting done uh, to when you come back to us to have that better understanding as to whether you're on track with phase one based on, on what you told us uh, earlier in the summer. Uh, the second question, though, is, is a broader one, and it goes to what you said to us previously, that the existing system is very, very tenuous, and the possibility of some sort of a catastrophic failure is a real one. And so one of the things that I'm also interested in is what contingency planning exists, uh, because we now have this four to five year timeline for this to get fixed. And if it is as bad as, as, as you have indicated to us previously, uh, I would, uh, would like to understand, is there a plan B? Is there a place to go uh, instead of an army of people with papers, pencils, and carbon paper that would have to be put in place in the event that that worst case scenario did happen? Yeah, and you probably just identified the worst case, which would be reverting to paper claims, which we would not want to do. Um, you know, I, I'll defer some of that to the Agency of Digital Services from the technology side, because I know that they've added some additional components you know, working with Blue Hill and our, our um, other data warehouse vendors on shoring up the, the, the platform that the mainframe code sits on um, to make sure there's redundancy there. Um, so if there's, you know, we're unlikely to experience a hardware failure. Um, right now, I think as long as we're not making changes to the system, we're trying to, um, you know, reestablish some internal controls in the system and integrity in the system so that we have more faith in the calculations that are being done. We have more faith in um, the determinations that are being issued. Um, all of that kind of goes hot haywire when um, you know, we, we start trying to make changes on the fly. So um, you know, Cameron, if you want to speak to really what you've seen, but because we're, we're really um, reestablishing Kind of the base system that was there before, uh, you know, we're we're not experiencing the I would say the frequency of failures. We are running into issues each and every day and every week, um, but the the potential for it um, going offline permanently um, is much less now because we're we're not we're kind of in repair mode as opposed to um, change mode. Uh, Cameron, do you want to add anything? I, I wouldn't add uh, a lot more to what you said, Commissioner. I would just uh, agree with your assessment there. You know, my, um, you know, now that we're not in the system making all these necessary changes related to these programs, I think the, the risk for potential overall system failure is a lot less. Uh, I know, as you mentioned, ADS has worked with our external partners to ensure that we have appropriate um, disaster recovery, et cetera, which I know they've done a lot to boost that and are continuing to do work uh, even throughout this calendar year to help upgrade aspects of the mainframe in order to make it more stable and secure. So there are things that they are doing to try to protect from that event. Um, and, and, you know, one of the concerns I have more is, is it's, um, you know, the lack of our ability to find qualified people to continue to maintain, you know, uh, and, and that's why I think it's, it's so important and a priority for us to get off the system as quickly as possible. Um, you know, one day, if, if a certain number of individuals, unfortunate things happen to them, they decide to leave employment, etc. It just becomes more and more difficult to find people qualified to make the necessary changes to operate the system. Uh, that's also one of the big concerns. So um, I, I would want ADS to come in and, and talk more specifically about in the event we had a disaster event, what that looks like, but I do know they've done a lot of work to help prevent that or have backup recovery example in, in those events. I, I was just going to say, I mean, the, the ability to back up to a previous date and time um, has been expanded. So, so that is um, a, a positive piece. Uh, what, what I would say is if there was some catastrophic, um, you know, 
backups where all the system went down and all the backups were lost? And then what would we do as a state? Um, you know, I think in, in other states that have experienced major natural disasters, um, you know, they've had to rely on other states' willingness to help process their claims. Um, and so the potential would be there for us to, to pull on our, our partner states to say, can you help us process claims for Vermont claimants? Um, and I think there'd be a need from the, the legislature at that point to help um, probably um, relieve some of the state specific requirements um, because obviously the system would be geared towards um, you know processing claims under a different state uh, statute um, for for everything from eligibility to payment amount. And so, um, you know, again, it just, I don't wanna say the potential is not there. Um, that would be a worst case, you know, um, end of life situation. But I think we've, we're, we're a long way from that given the, the system redundancies we have right now. And, and I would just very, very quickly at the very end, I would just, um, you know, we, it wasn't pretty and there were a lot of mistakes made and a lot of lessons learned, but, you know, I think we demonstrated in the pandemic, you know, in, in a worst case scenario, we, you know, first priority would be standing up some sort of web-based system to just intake application and make payment, you know, and then we, we, the, the priority number one would be to make sure people were not losing benefits. And, and I think we could very quickly stand up something that would be able to do that. And then you begin to work backwards from there and, and you figure out what other states could do to help. Or is there a general system we could get off the shelf that we could just plug in without making the necessary adjustments to, to simply keep the lights on? Um, you know, those would be the things that we would, we would look at in that event that our mainframe system went down with zero capacity to bring it back online. Senator Brock, you look like you may have a follow-up question. I want to wind this up and just make one. No, just, point. just, just the only concern uh, is about contingency planning generally. In terms of a recommendation, is the time to develop the contingency plan is not when the disaster happens. Right. Right. Um, so I just want to end by thanking you guys, uh, but also, um, Commissioner, I, I want to ask you and also uh, Secretary Curley because I think you probably can best address this. I mean, we've read a lot about why we have this workforce shortage, but you're probably more knowledgeable and Secretary Curley more knowledgeable, Vermont specific stuff. I'd just like to have you talk for a minute as to what you see. It may be everything we've read, but if you have any insight as to what's driving this workforce shortage. Yeah, at a future date, I'll, I'll turn it over to Matt, our economist who can dig down deeper, um, but for the sake of time, um, you know, what we saw as part of the pandemic is um, Vermont's aging population leaving the workforce. Um, so people that were close to at retirement age or beyond retirement age that had stayed in the workforce chose that time to leave, whether it was in their mind just the right time or whether it was health related concerns. Um, we also have seen just a lot of churn in the system. So people uh, took the opportunity of the pandemic to look at other careers and opportunities. Um, but as they did so, they left a vacancy um, behind. And so again, that may have been it, uh, probably to a lesser degree leaving the state more so obtaining skills or changing career paths. Um, which filled a spot in another area, but left a vacancy somewhere else. So um, the, the challenge is not unique uh, to Vermont. I was on a call yesterday um, with uh, states from our national association, and they were uh, to all talking about what are we doing in the workforce area around workforce expansion to either get people back to work, um, or in some cases where there just aren't enough workers in the states, how are they attracting um, individuals to those states to, to work in those states. So, um, you know, there's, to your points earlier about gig economy and, and um, flexibility with virtual work um, that has opened many doors, um, but not every 
every career, every job can be done uh, remotely. Um, and that I think is where we see our, our biggest challenges, whether it's in healthcare um, or, or services like childcare or um, leisure and hospitality, um, you know, those continue to be the areas um, or manufacturing for that matter, continue to be the areas um, where we're seeing the, the biggest gap in terms of available jobs and available people. Why manufacturing? What, is manufacturing any different than retail? Um, well, only if it requires a different skill. Usually also the challenges are uh, in, um, uh, uh, in terms of filling shifts because they're pretty defined shifts. But I think really, and, and I don't wanna speak for Matt, but I think what, what we would identify as the challenge is that the, um, the lag in demand and then the surge in product demand um, has caused them to actually expand. So it's not even, you know, one, they, they haven't been able to staff at normal levels, but they've actually looked to increase staffing um, to, to keep up with production demand and haven't been able to grow um, like they, they wanted to. Uh, and so that has been the challenge there. Thank you. That's, that's interesting. Okay, we're gonna let you guys go. Uh, what I wanna talk about is committee process so we probably can go offline uh and thank you again we'll have you back thank you everyone. appreciate thank it thank you